The FE4005, TOG2, Conway, 40 Ton Centurion and Conqueror are among the heaviest tanks you'll find here at the Tank Museum. In this compilation of heavy metal, heavyweight tank historian David Fletcher gives us his assessment of each. So sit back, relax and enjoy these five heavy tanks. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. Now this is FV4005. And I suppose I ought to level with you and say that it is not quite the original vehicle. You've got the original FV4005 turret and gun, and it's actually resting at the moment on a Centurion Mark 12 hull, if it doesn't fall to bits. When it was originally built, it was on a Mark III hull, and you could tell because it had Oh, and I think it's called a gun cradle, a sort of hinge thing on legs, on the glasses plate, and it had an earth anchor at the back to stop it recoiling too far. But they only left us the turret, so we've dumped it onto a Mark 12 hull just to show you what the thing would have looked like. Now, it's quite an interesting vehicle from a technical point of view because the turret contains a 183 millimetre gun which is probably the biggest gun ever fitted into a tank of any sort. I think it's probably the largest caliber. The vehicle stems from a, an argument that was going on in the early 50s about the um, viability of the more powerful gun as against a wire-guided missile. A lot of people were backing the wire-guided missile as the new anti-tank weapon and the British, in particular, were keen on getting an, an old conventional gun. And they went for the biggest gun because they wanted a tank that could knock out the heavy Russian tanks at a reasonable distance. Now, the powers that be worked out that 185 millimetres was the size that you needed for the gun that would go on the vehicle. And, of course, in the British don't like the idea of inventing a new gun, so they went for 183 millimetres, which, if you work it out, is 7.2 inches. Now, a gun with 7.2 inch calibre already existed in the British Armoury, so it was just a question of building a version of it that had an anti-tank capability. Now, there were two versions of FV4005. This is the turreted version, as you can see. The turret itself is a huge thing. It was only splinter-proof, no more. And it was designed, really, just to make the thing look effective. But it, it really does make for an impressive vehicle. The other vehicle, which doesn't exist anymore, had the, um, the gun in an open mounting. The difference was that the other one had an auto-loader this one was loaded by hand, which made it quite a difficult tank to, to operate because the rounds are enormous, they really are. They, it took two people to lift a 7.2 round up into a gun. So mostly you find that the thing would actually stow 12 rounds only in the turret. And they, they fitted a ramp in so that you could load the ammunition from the stowage point to the gun without anyone actually having to lift it, thank goodness, because that would have been quite crippling. But it really is an unusual vehicle. It, what we've got here is, a, as I say, a complete bodge up, but it's on the, the right make of hull, if nothing else. And as a static exhibit, it's quite a useful thing to have because there was only the one of it, and it does have this um, large turret and impressive gun fitted to it. But that's the vehicle FV4005. And it was an experimental version of Centurion, which just vanished a short while later. They gave up the idea of using a gun of this size. Now this is FV4202. It's actually known as the 40-ton Centurion. 
which is like saying it's a bit lighter. It actually weighs 41 tonnes, but no one seems to bother about that. It was just a question of having a catchy title. It's quite an interesting vehicle. It was built by Leyland Motors in 1956 to try out one or two ideas that were in the air towards the new Chieftain that was coming out shortly. Now, it's an unusual vehicle. Only three were built, and this is an amalgam of two of them. It's the remains of the one donated to the Tank Museum many years ago, plus another one which had been donated to Remy at Borden and used as a recovery hulk. They got rid of it, they came down here and we made one tank out of two. It still doesn't look very good, but it's quite an interesting vehicle. The third one, rumour has it, went to Israel. What they were supposed to do with it, Lord alone knows, but they, they've got one anyway. Whether it's in their museum, I don't know. It's quite an unusual vehicle. Now, the 40-tonne Centurion is quite interesting because they were only built to try out these new ideas. It wasn't really intended as a tank at all, although a lot of people argue that the, the way it's finished, with all the stowage and everything else, it's as good as any other tank in many respects. But it's quite odd in that it's the only tank ever powered by the Rolls-Royce Meteorite engine. The Meteorite was a V8. It was really a sort of shrunken version of the old Meteor, the V12, and it generated about 400 horsepower. But it was only ever used in this particular tank. It was used in the Antar tank transporter in quite large numbers. It was actually used in the um, F or TV 1000 the six-wheel vehicle. But other than that, it, it was never used in a tank as such, except for this vehicle here. So it's quite an interesting vehicle from that point of view. It's shorter than the Centurion. You can see that from the way the road wheels are down to five instead of six on each side. That's like two clusters of four, which work on a horseman system, but internally. And then a fifth wheel at the front which um, is working on half a system, if you like. So it's an unusual vehicle in that way. Now, it is an, there's another unusual feature as well. One of Chieftain's main assets was the fact that it was much lower than Centurion. And for that reason, they used a 28-inch diameter road wheel, a bit smaller than the road wheel on Centurion. The Centurion ran on road wheels of 31-inch diameter, and this particular machine, in fact all three of them, were fitted with the Centurion wheels, so it is that much taller. But it has two other features which are specifically done to test out ideas for um, Chieftain. The first, of course, is the needle nose turret. It's got a 20-pounder gun in, which is quite authentic. The only trouble is the gun's been wedged in, it's not fitted properly. So it doesn't really give you a good idea of what it would have looked like. But that needle nose turret is quite interesting. It's very heavily armoured, 170 millimetres on the front, and it's welded to the back half of a Centurion turret, so it's an odd setup at the best of times. But it was done to try and imagine what the turret would have looked like, and that's why it's like it is. The other thing they did was first introduced here, that's the reclining driver's position. Now. What they did was use the original hatch, the right-hand one of the Centurion, not the central position that was used in the, um, the Chieftain, but it still has the up-and-swing type of hatch lid to it there, which opens like a Chieftain's hatch. But the inside, it's quite odd. It has the reclining seat for the driver, but he can't actually drive in the reclining position. In the reclining position, in the Chieftain, the driver has two steering levers close by his side and he has a foot-operated gear change, rather like on a motorcycle. On this, he's got the normal gear change of a Centurion between his knees, which actually normally takes both hands to change, and he has a full set of pedals arrayed across the front which are difficult to work, impossible, in fact, to work lying down. You can only work on them sitting upright. And it has steering levers well forward. So you have to sit upright to drive the tank properly anyway. 
but it's got this reclining seat so that the driver can at least show the reclining position in this hull. But it does seem an odd arrangement, not being geared up to take the chieftain's method of driving at all. It's pure centurion in that respect. Um, same transmission, Merritt Brown, and the same driving arrangements at the front as the centurion which makes it quite an interesting contrast because it's not merely meant to be like that at all. But that allows for this strange shape. Um, the tank's actually fitted with a set of Centurion hush puppy tracks. They're these tracks with the rubber blocks on. They're not the originals. The original tracks were like Centurion open weave, but narrower, and um, they've, they've gone somewhere. They've got lost in the process of time and these ones have replaced it. And they're only there to show what, that it ought to have tracks on it, which it's got, but they're not the original ones, not by any means. It is an unusual vehicle in many respects. And really, an engine of 400 horsepower is not quite got the oomph for a 41-tonne tank. It's a little bit slow, but uh, it was only for demonstration purposes. That was all they produced it for, as far as we know. But uh, it is an interesting vehicle. And it's to say, the only one powered by a Rolls-Royce meteorite engine. Quite an interesting setup in itself. That's what makes this tank so unusual. Right, now what we've got here is Centurion Conway. It's absolutely unique, which is one of the reasons we've decided to film it. But like the 40-ton Centurion, it's in a bit of a state. It spent a long time out of doors, and I think that caused a lot of rust. But it, there's enough here to talk about, and in any case, it's a very interesting tank. The gun is the 120 millimeter American gun, the same as you'll find in M103, the American tank, and in Conqueror, the British tank with the same gun in it. And it's, it's that and the turret that I really want to talk about. The hull is an ordinary Centurion Mark III hull. They were quite common in their day, and every other aspect of it, all its mechanical arrangements are exactly the same as the Centurion. It's the fact that it has this turret. As you can see, it's a very big turret. It was actually designed by the Oster Aircraft Company, which sounds a rather unusual organisation to be designing tank turrets, but they did. It was built by Chubbs of Wolverhampton, probably better known as Safe Makers which is why it's quite heavily armoured as well. It's 140 millimetres on the front and about 95 on the sides, which is the only bits I've got the dimensions for. That means it was relatively proof against fairly heavy guns firing in the other direction. Now, the reason they produced it was because Conqueror wasn't ready. Conqueror was going to be the tank that we had, the heavy tank, to fire standoff shots over the heads of the Centurions at the approaching JS-3s, which was the bogey tank of the time. But they couldn't produce the turret quickly enough, so they decided to adapt it to fit a Centurion. Why they did it on a Centurion and not on a Conqueror hull, like Carnarvon, for instance, I don't know, because that would have made it more stable. But it was done on Centurion with the Oster-designed Chubb-built turret. And one of the reasons the turret is so tall is because the 120mm gun wouldn't fit in an ordinary mounting because of the recoil. It went back so far that it would have struck the turret ring, so they raised it up. In fact, it's quite odd because... the in that arrangement, it only has about 10 degrees of elevation and 5 degrees of depression, which is nothing. It's pathetic. I don't know why they did it. The gun was designed to take out the heavy Russian tanks. So um, that's why it's fitted with this gun. They were going to put it into production as an interim vehicle with, before Challenger came, or before Conqueror came out. But um, they decided not to, and in the end... This was the one and only Conway ever built, probably just as well. When we first found it, I remember when we were looking in it, when it first arrived, we opened the back door and found that the turret had been welded with two strips of metal running back from the turret ring to the hull of the tank itself. And it was clearly put in there to prevent anybody from traversing the turret. Now, if you look at most photos of Conway, 
There are a few about. You'll find the pictures show it with the turret fully traversed, firing back over the engine decks. But I think what they were trying to do was avoid having the turret turn to the flank because I think they thought that firing a 120 millimeter gun to the side would tip the whole tank over, which obviously they didn't want to do. And that's why they welded these things to make the turret rigid and only facing forwards, which is as you see it now. It's quite an interesting view. But altogether had a crew of four, a driver and three in the turret. And the ammunition for the 120, for the American 120, although it was um, brass case and um, the usual projectile was supplied as two separate units. You loaded the projectile first and then followed it up with the brass case, which had the explosive in it. Then you fired it. When you opened the breech, the brass case had to come out and be replaced again with the next one to fire the next round. That was an unusual arrangement. It led to the bag charge, which you see in Chieftain now, and subsequent tanks. But in those days, it had to be a brass case because that's the traditional way that ammunition was made. The other thing you'll find is the tank has a coaxial machine gun. That makes it a tank. It's quite odd, actually. It's really a tank destroyer. But a tank destroyer made as such wouldn't have a coaxial machine gun. This one does, and therefore it's a tank. And that's how they actually decide in one what a tank should be and shouldn't be, whether or not it had a coaxial machine gun. But that's Conway. It's FV4004 and was designed as a, as a heavy centurion, but not a very successful one, I don't think. They seem to have faded out as soon as they designed it, which I don't think does any harm anyway. But it's quite an interesting vehicle for us to show, and that's why it's on tank chats now. Now, this tank is known as the Conqueror. It's FV214. It was actually designed as a heavy tank, but it has quite a long story, which I'll try and encompass in this chat if I can. Um, we'll start at the bottom. I think it makes sense and gradually work our way up. The first thing to look at is the suspension. It's mostly hidden by the boxed-in skirting, you can see, but it's really like, in a sense, like the Centurion suspension, only smaller, more little rollers and smaller springs. But it works on the same principle. The only difference is that the rollers in this case have the rubber between the rim and the hub of the wheel. So in other words, you've got, um, as far as the rollers are concerned, you've got steel on steel on the tracks and only the rubber inside. Now that's very much like some of the later German tanks in the Second World War, probably where they got the idea from. It is resilient and it does save the rubber, but it makes a heck of a noise, metal on metal coupled with the noise of the engine from this thing, made it one of the noisiest tanks that was ever lo loosed on the public. But um, quite interesting for all that. It's got mentioned four bogies aside, typical rear drive sprocket and front um, adjust truck adjusting sprocket, exactly the same as any other tank, only it's a lot bigger. Now the hull, which is all of welded construction, it's mainly armoured, to about six inches, seven inches at the front. So it's quite well armoured for its day. And um, actually at the time when it was in service, between what, 1955 and 1966, it was the heaviest tank in service anywhere in the world, 65 tonnes. So it was quite a monster. It was powered by the Rolls-Royce Meteor engine, not because it was the best engine in the world, but because it was all that was available at the time. It was actually a fuel-injected version of the Meteor, which delivered about 800 horsepower, a little bit better than the, um, the horsepower rating of an ordinary um, Meteor, which is about 600 horsepower. So it gave 800 horsepower through a Merritt Brown transmission, just the same as any other tank. It meant that off the main roads, it was probably almost as fast as a, um, a, an ordinary tank, as a, say, a Centurion. 
and it worked quite well, but it, it was really a, a heavy tank, and it was meant to be, of course. So that's really the, the basic structure. Now, that part of the tank, that is the hull, the engine, all that transmission and so on, is all the same as what was originally designated as F A45 or FV201, the original universal tank. Now, this whole concept of a universal tank was actually coined by, what's his name, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. At the end of the war, he couldn't understand the difference between an infantry tank and a cruiser tank. He wanted something that brought both together. So he coined this term universal tank, and it was applied to FV-201. The trouble was that having built FV-201, it only had a Centurion turret with a 20-pounder gun, and two versions of it, at least three versions of it really, the DD, the amphibious version, and the bridge layer were both too big to fit on an existing landing craft, so they wouldn't work. And the other one they wanted to build, the mine-sweeping flail, was too long. It had a, an extra gearbox at the back, which made it longer than the hull that was readily available. So they decided to do away with FV-201 completely. So the whole thing, the whole concept of this universal tank vanished. It wasn't that good anyway. For a start, it had the same gun as the Centurion. So the 20 pounder, the 83 millimeter gun. And that was deemed to be useless against the heavy Russian stuff, which is what they were beginning to think of after the war as the, the next sort of potential enemy. So they um, did away with FV-201 completely, with the exception of the heavy gun version, FV-214, which is this thing. And this, it took a while to come out because it took them quite a long time to design the turret. But it is much bigger than any of the tanks you'll find around at the same time. Just for a while, anyway, bigger even than the Russian tanks it was meant to uh, obliterate. The next part of the tank is the turret. And that's the most important part. It did take a while to make because it's a large casting, one of the biggest they'd ever tried. And the gun itself was quite unusual. It's American 120 mil, but we'll come to that in a minute. So that's the next feature. It's a, a powered turret. It traverses under power, but it will only traverse to a, a limited speed, obviously. Now the gun, is, it was built by the Royal Ordnance Factory, but it's a version of what started out as an anti-aircraft gun in American service and was later adopted for use on one of their tanks, the M103. We've got one of those here somewhere and it's worth doing a comparison sometime between M103 and the British Conqueror, which were more or less contemporary. The only difference is M103 lasted a good deal longer. but. Um, Otherwise, they're more or less they had the same gun in them. That's the gun. It's 120 millimetres, as I say. It only fired two rounds, at least the two types of rounds. They supplied APDS, which is armour-piercing, discarding sabo, and HESH, which is high-explosive squash head. So it fired armour-piercing. It fired a form of high-explosive, but literally only those two. There were no other rounds made available for that gun at all. You had to use one or the other of those. They were stowed inside a few in the turret, in a ready use, or near the turret, in a ready use position. The rest near the driver, who could pass them back if need be, if he hadn't got anything else to do. He was only driving the tank after all. This, as I said before, is a Mark I. They only built about 20 of these. The rest, and I think they built about 158 in the end, the rest were Mark IIs. They can, you can always tell by the um, periscopes around the driver's position. If there's three, it's a Mark I. If there's one periscope, for all the views that you get in there, it's a Mark II. And that's how, one of the ways of telling the two tanks apart. But there's not many. They're almost identical in every other respect. It's got a four-man crew. That is three men in the turret and the driver who sits down here at the front. Now the driver 
as I say, sits in here. He's got the normal controls, but they, they actually instructed young drivers who were learning to double D clutch both up the box and down, which meant well, quite a struggle for a driver. But later on, drivers with some experience came to find that you could change upwards more quickly if you first of all got hold of one of the levers, there were two, which took care of steering, and you used one of those just to break the engine speed a bit. You slowed the engine down, therefore you could change up quickly through one gear or the other, and you needed to do it very quickly, because if the tank was left to its own devices for a moment, it would roll to a halt, and you'd have to go back to first and start again. So an experienced driver was worth having in one of these, but there weren't that many of them anyway, because well, there weren't that many tanks anyway, and that's probably why. Now, as I say, the turret mounts a 120 millimeter gun and the coaxial browning alongside, which is actually almost lost in this um, mess up here. A huge mantlet, or about 10 inches thick in armor protection. It was one of the best armoured parts of the tank actually but the, the turret itself was about nine inches thick in most places which meant it was a fairly tough proposition for anyone to crack that's why these tanks have lasted as hard targets for years and years and still you can still recognize what they are when they've been shot to pieces because they resist most of the incoming rounds quite effectively now, the other thing they had which affects the gun is that the gun was on a stabiliser. Now, normally a stabiliser is used to hold a gun steady no matter what the tank's doing. So the idea was that you could bounce over rough ground and the gun would remain on target. With the Conqueror, it was different. The stabiliser was in, put in to keep the gun from wrecking the, um, the mounting it was on. It meant that when this tank was doing any speed over 1.5 miles per hour, the um, stabiliser came into action. And the first view anyone had of a Conqueror coming towards them was normally the gun peering over the, the crest of the hill as it approached, up and down, up and down all the time. Nobody could do anything about it. It just kept doing that. You couldn't load it from inside because the breach was moving all the time, you couldn't stop it from outside, or you'd wreck the entire gun mounting. The only time when it wasn't like that was when the turret was reversed, which it was for normal driving, and then the gun was lowered and mounted all in a clamp at the back, so it was held by the, um, the clamp and didn't waddle about, otherwise it was all over the place. But anyway, that was part of the the nuisance of having such a big gun in such a big tank. The turret itself is interesting. It features three men, the loader, the gunner, and then the tank commander at the back. Now the loader and the gunner, for all the size of this turret, and it is quite enormous compared with any other, both of their positions were fairly cramped. They more or less had to stay where they were put. And, and really that was it. But the commander was in a different thing altogether. For a start, he had a totally rotating command post at the top of the tank. You can see it quite well when you come up a bit higher and look down on the tank. It meant that the whole section he was in rotated under power independently of the rest of the turret. So what would happen was this. The commander would select a target and we'll assume for the moment he's selected a heavy Russian tank. He'll select that target, and then using his, his telescope, he would um, put down the, what was needed for the velocity of the ground that went into it, and also the range. For the range, he actually had his own range finder built into the turret. It was a coincidental range finder, worked on two, like, like a tube, with a mirror at each end. It was the only British tank to have a range finder built into it. So it meant that the commander could find the target, could latch onto it, and send a message to the gunner, which came up on the screen of his own sights, 
which gave the range and everything else needed to hit that tank. So all the gunner had to do was turn the turret round to face the enemy tank or and fire the gun to the um, figures he got on his own sight. That's all he had to worry about. Now, while he was doing that, the commander was free to select the next target. So it, what it meant was that the tank was in effect what we would now call a hunter-killer tank. It actually went out looking for fights and looking for vehicles to destroy, and that's what it was, a pure hunter-killer tank. But it also came up with a system which was faster than any other tank in existence. It could look at a target, and while the gunner's firing at one, it could be selecting the next one, and so on. And that really was remarkable for a tank like this. It meant it could take out one tank after another. In fact, these tanks were never, ever used in action. They were issued to each regiment in small numbers, some of whom used them collectively as part of a squadron. Others just issued them to each squadron and they came together at the end to fire above and over the heads of the existing tanks, which were normally centurions. The job of the conqueror was to take out the Russian heavy tanks, which were at the back of their attack. And they'd take them out before they got anywhere near the centurions, which they could seriously damage. And that's what the purpose of the Conqueror was. But the Conqueror never saw any action at all, at all. It was in service in what was then known as West Germany for years. But from about 1966 onwards, it had vanished completely. This and the Centurion were taken over by Chieftain, which is the next in line here. And um, with that, the Conqueror disappears. The only thing was there were two armoured recovery vehicle versions of Conqueror, one of which, the ARV Mark II, is regarded as one of the best ARVs or recovery vehicles the British Army's ever had. And that was one of the few variations of this thing. They did talk about a version with a, a rear-mounted turret mounting a 183mm gun or 180mm gun, which was meant because the gun on this thing, although it's big and quite powerful, still couldn't take out the Russian tanks it was meant to take out. They stood a better chance of taking out it, which wasn't really the idea, but that's why they went for this 180mm gun. But uh, as far as we know, it never got beyond the mock-up stage and was only a, as an idea, really. Not, not a real tank, but quite interesting all the same. So here we have it. This is the Conqueror. In its day, one of the biggest, heaviest tanks in the world. Now, this is TOG-2. It's the heaviest tank in the museum. It weighs 80 tonnes. In fact, it's TOG-2 Star, which was it in its final form with torsion bar suspension. Before that, being a First World War style of tank, it had no suspension at all, just rollers fitted in the frames. As you'll see, it was actually built by Fosters and Sons in Lincoln, well, it's Foster and Co in Lincoln, who were the, um, the original First World War tank builders. They came back and did all the construction of this thing as well. Now, the tank's diesel electric. It's powered by a Paxman Ricardo V12 diesel engine, 600 horsepower, and that drives into two electrical generators by English Electric, and they in turn drive into two electric motors which power the tank along. Now one of the drawbacks is with all these diesel and petrol electric systems is the amount of room they take up, which is why there's so much of this tank behind the turret, going back for miles, it seems, largely just to accommodate all this kit. It's also incredibly heavy. It makes the tank very really heavy and really unnecessary in every other respect. But the trouble is that Sir Albert Stern, who was head of the old gang, the people who designed the tank, he'd been a petrol-electric man since the First World War. Usually wrong, but it didn't stop him from trying. And he was the one, I think, who... Wallace insisted that diesel electric would do for this tank. And that's one of the reasons it's so big and so heavy. As it was finished in its final form, it's got 65 millimeters of armor on the front, 
which is quite good. It's not as good, actually, as Matilda, which was 80 millimeters, but it was quite good in its day. But it, the turret it's got on it is the same as that fitted to the A30 Challenger later on. It's the turret with the 17-pounder anti-tank gun. But this only came in at the last minute. When this thing was first built, it had a large turret with a, um, a triple mount in it, a two-pounder, a three-inch howitzer, and a Beza machine gun. They, that was very fashionable for a while. It also had a three-inch howitzer in the hull. Well, the second turret had a three-inch anti-aircraft gun fitted, and then they went to the third turret with this 17-pounder. They couldn't really make up their minds. It was only a prototype anyway. It was designed for a war that never was going to happen because they thought that there'd be a, a new Western Front between the Maginot Line and the Siegfried Line, which is where this tank was going to play about. But in fact, it had been designed for a war that had been over for 20 years by the time they got round to building it. So it was a complete waste of time, waste of resources and everything. Far too big and far too clumsy to use as a fighting tank. Um, but that's really the reason behind its size. Now, the other thing, which is quite unusual, is that the turret doesn't rotate on a, a ball race, as most turrets do. It's actually on a phosphor bronze ball in the center of the fighting compartment. And the reason for that was you could actually jack the tur turret up. There was a lever. And if the shell struck the turret ring and caused a bulge of any sort, you could actually jack the turret up with a little lever until it went over it. And that's why it's another reason it's got so much room inside. The tank had a crew of six. It's rather difficult sometimes figuring out what all six of them would do. There clearly was three in the turret. There's one driver in the center in the front, maybe another man with him. But what the sixth man did, Lord alone knows. I suppose he just sort of put him in there because there was room to do so. There's enough room actually to hold a dance in the fighting compartment, there's stacks of room in there. And uh, it's, it's quite an interesting tank. And they say that it, so the, the development of the, um, the track system and the, the transmission particularly was very influential later on. I really don't know where they get that idea from because nobody ever used diesel electric again, thank goodness, in tanks in Britain anyway. The other thing they always say about the tank is that the length of track in touch with the ground is so long against such a narrow vehicle that it was impossible to steer. Well, I've actually seen a bit of footage of this thing moving, and it doesn't actually appear to have much of a problem steering, so even that may turn out to be a bit of a myth in the end. There's a lot of stories attached to this tank, and it's not really that wonderful a machine, but it's interesting. As I say, being the biggest and heaviest in the museum, makes people stop and stare at it anyway. Now, the only other thing I'd like to do is walk around to the side and show you something there. Now, this portion here is where the sponsum went. When they originally designed the tank, they were thinking very much on First World War lines, and it had a female tank sponsum on the side, on each side, in fact. And on the, the mock-up that I've seen pictures of, it had a Beza machine gun front and back just so that they could sweep the sides. But that idea was dropped, along with the hull, machine, the hull gun, which they thought of at one point. They did away with those completely and brought the tank more to a more modern appearance with these two rather ludicrous side doors. They're very handy for looking inside, but not a lot of good for protection. You really need fairly thick armor, which it's got in most places. Um, but that's really the only thing. It just brings it into line with the, the early First World War tanks. But in the old days, before it had the sprung suspension, it was very much like a First World War tank, bumping along the ground, had a top speed of about eight miles an hour, which wasn't really fast at all. But um, as I say, they, they did say it was difficult to steer, and I don't believe that for a minute. I think with diesel-electric drive, you could probably steer quite easily, even though it is a big machine. <laughs>